Hey there gang, time for another comic book unboxing video and as always I have no idea, none at all, what is in this box of comic books which I have been given to grade for sale on eBay. So if you like comic books, stick around, we're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bobby. Hey, welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is an unboxing video. Tura Toure. <laughs> because in recent videos, I have uh, I've been trying to sell you stuff, uh, and that stuff, of course, is still available. The uh, Halloween Mystery Box series. And if you enjoy and support this channel, the best way you can demonstrate that support is by going to the link, which is in the description and also the first comment on this video. Going there and buying yourself one of those mystery boxes. But now we're done the commercial. <laughs> we're back to just the regular unboxings. Now, of course, it's, it's always kind of a semi-commercial because, you know, I'm up front with you. I let you know where these boxes are coming from and where they're going. Uh, I work for a company that buys and sells comic books online. And the books that we sell as what we call raw singles on eBay, it's my job to grade those books. And uh, yeah, so that's where these books will be going. The seller name is .com Comics, if that should interest you. But if not, hey, we're here to really just kind of look at and have a, a, a fun dialogue about some really cool comic books. Rather, it's the stories or the art or, or even the marketplace for those books. So, please do like, share, subscribe, comment, do all the groovy things. Let's not waste any time. The preliminaries are out of the way. Let's start geeking out. And, um, you know, I tell you that I have no idea what is in the box, but I did tell a little fib. These first few uh, I put in this box myself, so I, I do know what these are. <laughs> I had my eyes open when I put them in the box. And the reason these are here, uh, in addition to grading the books that we sell as raw singles, I also manage uh, the fixed price sales on eBay, the, you know, the buy it now function. Uh, and these were books that were in boxes to do uh, as buy it now, and I pulled them out to sell as singles. And because Suicide Squad here, number 48 and 49, uh, those are both valuable books. They involve Barbara Gordon becoming Oracle. And so, uh, yeah, uh, even though the whole Oracle phase is gone, done with, many years past, it's still kind of a big deal with the, the primary contingent of comic book fans. You know, the, the comic book readership doesn't turn over every three to five years as it did back in the golden age, the silver age. Uh, people read books pretty much <laughs> lifelong once they get hooked. And so the, the kind of prime age fanboy, those 30, 40 year olds, they remember these books very fondly. And their Batgirl is still Oracle. So those are both valuable books as singles. And when I say valuable, and you know this if you've watched this channel uh, at all before. When we sell any lot on eBay, we're trying to get at least $10 for that lot. If we get below 6 or 7 we actually end up losing money once you account for labor costs of processing the books, the cost of acquiring the collections, the overhead of our offices in Freeport, Maine. And so uh, we'd like to get at least 10 bucks. So we get you know, a little bit of a profit margin there to reinvest. And, uh, and so when we say a raw single, that's a book that we think is going to bring 10 bucks all by itself. And sometimes, you know, these could have been used to goose up a lot of suicide books. You know, here's 49, and if you had, you know, 49 through 57. You know, you could goose up that lot by putting this in it. But Suicide Squad sells well enough that I don't think you really need to do that. You can do a lot of, you know, any 10 issues and, and get, you know, at least 10 bucks. Maybe even seven or eight. Uh, so anyway, I pulled those out. This one also, number 22, uh, uh, 23, excuse me. I forget exactly what this has to do, uh, but I think that's got something else to do with uh, Barbara Gordon. Can't remember what exactly, but I just, I remember it, uh, it flipped a switch when I saw it. So I hope I guessed right. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. I mean, it never hurts, you know, occasionally to take a book and sell it as a single just to see how it does, to kind of test the market here and there. But I think that's something. I'll put on screen. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I'll put on screen what that is. This is, uh, if you're not familiar, Pacific Comics. Pacific was a distributor, a West Coast distributor of comic books back in the uh, 70s and early 80s. And they tried their hand at actually publishing books. And you could get all of the comic books published by Pacific Comics and probably have fewer than 100 books. 
So it's a fairly easy collection to put together and not, not a lot of them are you know through the roof price-wise. This is a, a series Star Slayer, Log of the Jolly Rogers. This was by Mike Grell, who was pretty hot at that time. And it lasted uh, six or seven issues at Pacific and then went over to First Comics when Pacific kind of ran into uh, some publishing problems. But there are a couple of issues of this series that are particularly uh, valuable because this one, number five, has in the back here, that is the second appearance of Gru the Wanderer. And you can see they're advertising his, uh, his own title. And this one, number three... This is the second appearance of uh, the Rocketeer. So that's that's pretty cool. And of course, uh, issue two is the first appearance of the Rocketeer. So those are both like uh, $20, $25, $30 books. Uh, Gru I don't, doesn't sell as well as he used to. Uh, people have kind of forgotten who he is. But with the uh, movie news for the Rocketeer, those books could be taking off. Uh, this one I pulled just because it's a popular uh, Brian Bollard cover. This one is considered to be a classic, iconic cover, also by Brian Bollard. It's a little hard, and my lighting here, I'm still kind of at the kitchen table and not, not back in the uh, attic space. Uh, I need to get some better lighting. So I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a hard book to get in really high grade because of the white cover, and this one even... It's tanning just a little bit, but that is a very popular, that's like an, an $80 book. So those are the books that I put in there myself. And now we will kind of zip through everything else we have in this box. See if we can get through the whole box in one video. <laughs> anyway, uh, New Avengers number seven, that's the first appearance uh, of the Illuminati as a team, I believe. Marvel Superheroes Winter Special X-Men 1991. What is this? Is this first appearance of Squirrel Girl, maybe? I'm not sure. Let me look it up. And it is. I uh, did a quick quick check on the phone there on the uh, interwebs. And that's the first appearance of Squirrel Girl. She didn't merit the cover, but she is uh, inside there. Here's some uh, popular books. Journey into Mystery does really well. Even in low grade, it does well, which is kind of interesting because Tales of Suspense, Tales to Astonish, Strange Tales, those concurrent anthology titles, uh, in lower grade, you really kind of want to put them in uh, multi-book lots to get a good price for them. But Journey in the Mystery does sell even in low grade, even in two or three. Captain America Annual number eight, that's a classic uh, iconic Mike Zek cover, very, very popular book. Okay, and X-Men number 303, and this is the copper variant. Now, the big deal about this issue, this is the death of magic, Alania Rasputin. But, as always, don't worry, she got better. <laughs> but, uh, this copper variant, this said uh, this wasn't sold on uh, newsstands or in comic shops. This uh, was a premium that was included in the X-Men board game manufactured by uh, an outfit called Pressman. And uh, I, I've never really heard of Pressman outside of knowing these two books. I say two because there's also a Pressman variant of issue 302. The, uh, the 302 Pressman goes for like 125 bucks. This one goes for about 10 bucks. Uh, and then, of course, the regular issues of both of these are like, you know, $3 books. But uh, anyway, that's what that is. That is the Copper Pressman variant. Uh, alias, so this is January Jones. So that's, uh, that's kind of a big deal, number one. X-Factor, you've seen this plenty of times. That is the first full appearance of Apocalypse. Deadpool, the circle chase, not the circle jerk, <laughs> as Deadpool would probably say, but the circle chase. Uh, and this is, I believe, the, the first Deadpool limited series. I'm not sure. I mean, Deadpool has had so many series that they all blend together in my brain. Uh, so, I think that's the first limited series. This is kind of neat, X-Men 97, so a pretty early appearance, but this is, you can see here, 9 pence. Uh, and this is actually a P. We've seen uh, the sticker that had uh, 9D on it. Not sticker, but it's a stamp. 
And one of the folks in the comments, because I had asked why a D if it means pence, and the D, even though they would pronounce the D as pence, you know, somebody buying the book would say, you know, nine pence. Uh, it had a D, which stood for the Roman denarius, I think. Not denarius from Game of Thrones. <laughs> if I'm pronouncing it correct, the, uh, the Roman coinage is where that symbol came from. But this is a P. Apparently, the UK has new money and old money. Uh, the P.G. Woodhouse novels that I read are the old money. And I don't know, maybe by the time this came along, we're talking the new money, because that is a P. Again, if you're uh, from the UK or you're familiar with uh, how, their, how their monetary system works now and in the past, go ahead and school us all in the comments below. Avengers Annual number 10, that's the first appearance of Rogue, so that's a big deal. Here's a nice old X-Men, X-Men number 36. Gotta like that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Mechano lives. All right, we'll keep on trucking. Here's some Frankenstein action for you on X-Men number 40. Or I know, it's the monster Frankenstein. It's not actually Frankenstein. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 I know. I'm still gonna call him Frankenstein. <laughs> and I'm gonna call him Juggernaut because that's his name. So there you go, and that's a Marvel Pop Art Productions, Wolverine versus the Hulk, and I think that's the only big deal about that, is that it's Wolverine versus the Hulk. He's got the bone claws here, which I wouldn't think bone claws, well, I take that back. We've got cats that have torn the hell out of our house, so I guess I guess bone claws do <laughs> can do some damage. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, if they're not laced with adamantium, what can they do? But anyway... Uh, Wolverine, the uh, first ongoing series, number one. Looks nice, but you always have to check the back cover on this. Spider-Man number one, the silver edition variant, so that was most likely a direct sales book. May or may not have come in the bag. It doesn't have one now. New Mutants number 87, uh, this is the first appearance of Cable, the first uh, full appearance of the adult Cable, and this gold cover uh, that's the second print. Wolverine 27. I don't know what the big deal is with this. And we've we've sold it as a single recently. And it hasn't done that well. So I don't think this is, is as big as whoever put it in this box thinks it is. But we'll see how it does. If you love that book, then by golly, it's coming up for sale soon. Dot com Comics is the seller name. Uh, X-Force number 11. The first uh, appearance of the actual Domino. Earlier appearances were another character in disguise as her. X-Force number two. This is the second appearance of Deadpool, but really doesn't do that well. This one will, this one will be lucky to get to 10 bucks, frankly. X-Factor 24. First appearance of Archangel. Or, you know, Angel as Archangel. This is apparently a big deal because it is a, uh, a Wolverine-Deadpool fight. But <laughs> I've told you before... I would know that was Deadpool by looking at it. I would have guessed that was Spider-Man, maybe. So, but I guess, you know, the swords here give it away, but they're kind of hidden up there, so I don't know. Here's another X-Force number two and another X-Factor number six. Here is an X-Force annual, excuse me, X-Men annual number 14. And that's the uh, first appearance of Gambit. Uncanny X-Men uh, 266, often listed as his first appearance, but he does actually first appear in this book. This is uh, X-Men uh, Volume 2, number 5, and that is uh, an Omega Red appearance. Second appearance, here is his first appearance in number 4. So that's all Coolio McCool. I wonder how much of this box is going to be X-Men. We could be we could be on a whole X Men kick here. Here's, here's another annual 14. Here is uh, number 221, first appearance of Mister Sinister. Star Wars. Well, it's not going to be all X Men at any rate. And we've got two Star Wars here. Now these are two different versions. And I've told you before in a recent video, and I, I threatened to go over the different versions. So why don't I take a moment and do that right now? So Star Wars number one. It came out in. 
early April 1977, so it was on stands about a month before the movie. The first six issues of the Marvel Star Wars series from 1977 adapt the first movie. What I call Star Wars, and you may call uh, Star Wars Chapter 4 A New Hope. <laughs> It's just it's just Star Wars. Uh, but the first six issues adapted the movie art by Howard Chaikin. And uh, the first two and I think three issues all came out before the movie hit theaters. So you've got you've got a, at least five versions of this book. And the version that has a UPC code and the 30 cent uh, price in the square box. This obviously isn't it. I'm just describing it to you. That's the first print, the newsstand edition, and that goes for about 200 bucks in near mint. And then you've got a 35 cent variant. Same thing, has a UPC code, has the square price box. And that was very limited distribution in about six markets, testing the 35 cent cover price. And I've heard at print were only about 1,500 copies of that issue, so fewer now. And that one goes for like... <sighs> 5,000? <laughs> so that's clearly the one that you want. Uh, and then there's a second print. And the second print, again, has the UPC code, has the square price box. And just like this one, it says reprint up here by Luke's shoulder. And it will say uh, second printing in the Indicia uh, down, down here. And then you've got these Whitman variants. And this is the first and second Whitman variant. And these were generally sold in pre-packs. Uh, you know, three-pack comics in department stores. And so it's got the diamond box with no UPC code. And then the second printing of the R Whitman has, like this one, it says reprint up here. Now, I have seen uh, blank UPC codes with a diamond price, and that's allegedly a direct sales book. And I had thought the differentiation in the cover on, on newsstand and direct sales books didn't come along until the 40 cent era, and it's hard to find good examples of that. Every price guide I look at, and not just price guides, but you know, databases like the uh, Grand Comics database, comics.org, none of them list all of the different variants. Uh, some of them, and I'm not talking about the newer variants, like the facsimiles and the reprints and things like that, you know, from the past 10 or 15 years. I'm talking about the ones that actually came out in 1977. They all seem to list different ones. But I've seen ones that have a UPC code in a diamond box, and maybe that is a, uh, a, a direct sales book. And then I've seen Whitman's that have both a 30 and 35 cent. Not that it really matters because, again, they became in like three packs. They were like three for 99 cents or something like that. Anyway, that's, that's a, little, a little bit of what I know, which isn't much on Star Wars number one. <laughs> Here's something I don't know much about at all. Mysteries of Unexplored Worlds number two. That's cool. Look at that. Very nice. That's a Charlton book. That looks to be mid-50s or so, mid to late 50s. Yeah, mid to late 50s, 10 cent cover. That's cool. Very cool indeed. Marvel Superhero Secret Wars number one. That's a standard book. Infinity Gauntlet number one. Still does well. Oh, neat. Kanga. Now, I think it's pronounced Kanga, but I always, and, you know, with like John Johns and, and uh, things like that, I always tend to pronounce these apostrophes as kind of stutters or hiccups. So as a kid, I would have pronounced that as Kanga. <laughs> Sounds like I'm choking on it a little bit, uh, but I think it's just Kanga. This has uh, got a lot of water damage, though, and some mold. Some rusty staples. This is a really low-grade book. But uh, there it is. Kanga. Kanga, I can't tell if that's a 4 or a 9, if that's 14 or 19. This is nice, though. Look at this. And that's a nice condition. I don't know. I don't know why this didn't go to CGC. That's what I would have done with it. Well, you get this book uh, from us on uh, eBay. Again, Sellername.com Comics. You send that to CGC, you flip it, you might be able to do well for yourself. But that is EC Comics Weird Fantasy number 18. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. I like how the uh, the rockets fit into these slots, and I guess they they, they fire out like the, if, if you're old enough to remember the Hot Wheels 
uh, <laughs> booster thing on the tracks. <laughs> so that reminds me of, oh, this is sweet. Decent. Nice Jack Davis cover. Tales from the Crypt number, oh, black ink on a dark blue cover. Hard to see. 34. Look at that. Look at that. Tales from the Crypt, 34. Nice. What a sweet Jack Davis cover that is. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Lady in Peril. <laughs> and Weird Science. Now, EC is known for its horror books, but I really, I dug the uh, the science books, the, the sci-fi books, even more than the horror books. Here's Weird Science number six. And again, this is a nice shape. I don't know why we didn't send this to CGC. That's exactly what I would have done. Those are some freaky looking monsters. How do they how do they hold or manipulate anything with those with those giant web fin hands? Three eyes, back tentacles, shoulder tentacles. That's freaky. That'll give you nightmares. Wow. Wowzy, wow, wow. Leave a comment down below if you know which cartoon character said wowzy, wow, wow. <laughs> I, I bet there's not one of you who knows the wowzy, wow, wow. <laughs> Here's Weird Science number eight. And that's freak. You know who that is? That's the he. There's a religion around this guy. That's the flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> That is the one and only original flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> ah, you look that up on the internet. All right, Fantastic Four, 353. This is the first appearance uh, of Mobius E. Mobius from the recent uh, Loki TV series. And so this has taken off because of that. This, I think, 352, I think, is a Mobius cameo or something. I'm not sure. But these these sold just recently and didn't do that well. That only went for like three or four bucks, and uh, and these were like you know nine nine twos, and this one went for like ten or twelve. So these these haven't done as well as maybe they should have or as they have recently. Now it looks like we're back to the uh, X Men books. There's number forty one against the subhuman Professor X, somebody else who died and got better. A great menacing Magneto cover. Uh, this is uh, number 44 from the period. There was a period there where they uh, kind of minimized the X-Men uh, part of the logo and kind of featured the individual characters in kind of their own logos. And I don't know if they were kind of testing the waters because sales were not doing that well, maybe trying to figure out if they had one character that was more popular than the others that they could maybe break out into their own series, or maybe they just thought, you know, X-Men as a title wasn't covering it, and maybe these the character names would sell it better. Don't know. But this is the angel meeting the uh, Golden Age uh, winged character, the Red Raven. So that's cool. That's, uh, you know, Key Collector would tell you that's a key, because that's a revival of a Golden Age character. Of course, Key Collector says everything's a key. And they also, uh, they also did these two first. So here's Beast and Iceman. And Cyclops and Marvel Girl. A nice uh, Jim Steranko cover. Very trippy. Another Steranko cover. That one's got a lot of uh, power and drama to it. Although his shadow looks like a cat creature. <laughs> I don't think that was the intent. But <laughs> anyway, there's number 52. Number 19. In pretty nice shape. Wow, that's like a five, maybe? I don't know. They always look better in the bag. I'll know better once I get it out of the bag and actually grade it. But that's a that appears to be a nice-looking book. That's something I might have sent to CGC. A lot of stuff in this box I would have sent to CGC. But, I don't know. I'm not always right. Here's number 22. Number 23. So, if you are familiar with the X-Men, you probably know that uh, the series went to about... Issue 66, then went into reprints uh, until they uh, developed the new X-Men. And so that was a good 
seven or eight or nine years anyway, uh, that they were in reprints. Why did the original X-Men, do you think, not take off? I mean, they tried giving them individual costumes. They tried highlighting the different characters. They brought in superstar artists like both uh, Steranko and Neil Adams, although both were at the beginning of their careers when they were on this book. But the X-Men, you know, in its initial incarnation, yeah, it lasted quite a while, you know, 66 issues, but just never quite took off. Why do you think that is? And what is it, do you think, that uh, really stuck with the new X-Men? Although the new X-Men was kind of a slow burn. You know, they debuted with the giant size issue. And then uh, uh, in 94, issue 94 of the regular series. And it wasn't really until around issue 132 or so that they really, really took off. And why do you think that is? Why, why do you think the initial X-Men just didn't catch hold? And the later X-Men did, but why did it take a while for that to happen? I don't know. Here's some more Juggy action. Juggy. Juggernaut Jughead. That would make a, that would make a good Marvel Archie Comics crossover. <laughs> uh, here's number 34. Number 53. 54, one of the worst comic book covers of all time, I think. And maybe... Maybe that's what killed it. Maybe Steranko and Neil Adams just could not pull out of the hole that the X-Men fell into during this period. Uh, Roy Thomas took over the writing from Stan Lee fairly early uh, and, you know, was admittedly wordy uh, in, you know, he always has been, although by the time I came along, I really enjoyed it. But if you read some of his earlier stuff, it's like really, really purpley, prosy really word salad kind of stuff. Um, and the art by um, Reinman, Paul Reinman, just wasn't that good. There is a, uh, a very captivating cover, grabbing onto the logo, number 56, 57 with the Sentinels, and this is some Neil Adams stuff now. Sauron. And uh, some more Sauron. The Triumph of Magneto. Sunburst. Oh, Sunfire, excuse me. 65. And here it is. This is the last original issue for a while, number 66, where they face off against the Hulk. And then uh, there was a, a, a good, fun John Burns series that was out in the... Um, when was it? Late 90s, early 2000s? It was called X-Men The Hidden Years. And that series picked up where this issue left off, if I recall correctly. Uh, and it didn't last all that long, but it was it was it was good. I enjoyed it. So, and here's number seventy-four. So that's during the reprint era, new covers, but old old material inside. Here's some more X Men, and we're kind of reprinting reprinting away. We've already seen most of these, the original issues. And that's the last reprint before we got the new X-Men. Of course, the first few, if we had them, went right to CGC for sure. But here's number 98 in decent shape. Decent. Been watching a lot of Trailer Park Boys lately. <laughs> decent. <laughs> Although that is something I, I would have been prone to say anyway. 104, nice homage to number one. 107 with the Imperial Guard. Number 113, one of my earliest issues. My first issue was 111. There's some uh, Colossus as the Proletarian. The Power of Proteus. Oh no, poor Jean Grey. And here she is. Here's where she dies. But, again, she got better. The classic, that's just an iconic cover. You gotta love that. So the first part of the two-part Days of Future Past story. So amazing, they did that incredible story in just two issues. That would be a 27-part crossover today with, with you know, a bunch of ancillary one-shots and tie-ins and crap. <laughs> 
Amazing Adventures featuring the Beast. Still gray here. They haven't quite wised up to make him blue yet. And then right back to the X-Men, number 120, some Alpha Flight. Here's the, we mentioned this earlier, there's what's often called the first appearance of Gambit. And I guess it's his first full appearance, first cover appearance anyway. It's a nice classic Storanko cover with Polaris, X-Men number 50. And now we're into Tales to Astonish, number 97. What do you think of that? And you know, we're not quite done. Not quite done. Here's some more Hulk, number 120. 127. Random backing board. 161. Early appearance of Nightcrawler. Oh, and it's Amazing Spider Man 161. Early appearance of Nightcrawler outside of uh, the X Men books. Daredevil number 155, when the book is very close to cancellation. And with number 158, they decide to take a chance on a, a then new and upcoming, virtually unknown artist, Lanky Frank Miller. <laughs> but at this point, this book is just teetering on the edge of cancellation. This is the second. Frank Miller issue. Here's a nice Marvel team up, Hulk and Spider Man. Micronauts number eight. I love the Micronauts, but uh, I still don't see why this one is such a big deal. It's the first appearance of Captain Universe, but uh, that one sells for quite a bit more than I, I think it should. This one is still, still hot, hot, hot. That'll be a That'll be a $40, $50, maybe $60 book. Moon Knight number one. The first Moon Knight number one. Here is ROM number one. Doesn't do quite as well, but still pretty neat. Avengers number 15. Nice. Here's another Avengers Annual 10 we saw earlier. Giant Size Hulk number one. Hulk Smash! Are there two books in here? Or is that two bags? It's two bags. First appearance of Hellcat, Avengers number 144. First appearance of Patsy Walker as Hellcat. Both Patsy Walker and the costume had appeared previously, but this is their first appearance, one and the same together. Here's Nova number one. Nova was touted as the next big thing and only lasted about 25 issues or so, but he is still around and part of the MCU. Here is uh, the, well, how do you want to do it? I guess we'll call it the third appearance of Wolverine. Wolverine had a cameo, a one-panel cameo at the end of number 180. Had his full appearance in 181, and then he has this cameo in 182. And this is this book is taking off. It's, it's basically a poor man's Hulk 181. But he only appears in just, just that first page. You see, it's the... The denouement of the uh, fight from the previous issue. The helicopter comes, takes him away, and, and he's gone. So he just appears in a couple of panels there on the first page. That is his, uh, his third appearance. This is nice. Somebody, well, I mean, it's nice in that it's Fantastic Four 26, a uh, crossover with the uh, Avengers, but somebody has cut out the corner box here. Probably pasted it on their notebook or their bedroom wall or something. Now this is uh, this is sweet. Uh, it's in very low grade, but Fantastic Four number fifty. So that's uh, that's a big Silver Surfer issue. And there's X Men number one hundred. That's a significant issue. And this is a much parodied, much copied, much homaged cover. And this is the last stack in this box here. Just a few more issues to go. Here's the second part of that uh, Days of Future Past two-parter. Here's another, another copy of the first part. X-Men 139, a classic Kitty Pride issue. 140 with Wendigo. 138, Cyclops is quitting. 102, some juggernaut action. 
Daredevil 77 with Submariner and Spider-Man. Black Goliath number one. This is a good series to uh, get your hands on if you can. It's only five issues. It's a pretty cool uh, artifact of the times. Here's another Nova number one. Ms. Marvel number one. Nice. That'll do well. Here's another uh, Marvel Team Up 53. X-Men 99, and we'll start it off kind of where we began. We began with a uh, British version of this book, and we'll end with the American copy. So there you go. Well, John, I'm sorry we didn't see any of your books in this box, or even any DC books. <laughs> but, hey, you know, we never know. We never know. If, if the action figure I picked out matched what was in the boxes, people would know I was speaking. <laughs> so, uh, I don't, so I never know which action figure to pick. But we lucked, uh, we lucked out this time, or we were out of luck, I should say. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I had fun. If you're interested in bidding on these books, please do uh, go to eBay. The seller name is .com Comics. Usually a week or so after this video is up, you'll see those online. But, you know, if you just want to chat about these books or the characters or the market value, please do sound off in the comments below. And until the next boxing, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.